All right. So hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to another installment of the online 3D geometry and vision seminar. Uh, my name is Angela Yao, and I'm an assistant professor at the School of Computing at the National University of Singapore. So we are streaming from Asia today, and hopefully this is a convenient time then for everyone in the Eastern Hemisphere and also the West Coast of North America. Um, so today we have with us as a speaker, Siddhartha Chowdhury. And uh, Sid is a senior research scientist at the Creative Intelligence Lab at Adobe Research. He's also an assistant professor on Lee from IIT Bombay. So Sid's work, he uh, combines geometric analysis, machine learning, and also uh, user interface innovations to make 3D geometric modeling accessible for everyone, even non-expert users. And his research themes, they include assembly-based modeling, semantic attributes for design, generative neural networks for shapes, and other applications of deep learning to 3D geometric processing. And today, he's going to be talking to us about conditional detailization, which I believe is his uh, latest work, which will be presented this year at CVPR. And with us as panelists for today's talk are Sudipta Singha from Microsoft Research and Gao Ling from the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So we will be having a panel discussion in Q&A after Sid's talk. And as audience members, you're all welcome to also type in your questions into the YouTube uh, chat box. So without further delay, then I will uh, give the uh, speak, uh, give hand over to Sid to uh, start his talk. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, can you hear me? It's the sound operation. Perfect. Uh, it's it's wonderful to be part of a wonderful lecture, lecture series like this uh, with you know, so many awesome speakers. There have been a lot of interesting talks. It's also great to be uh, on a panel with um, such wonderful co-panelists. So I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards, much more so than my own talk. Uh, and, and I think that's the uh, more interesting and interactive part of these uh, these, these events anyway. So it's, it's good to be here. As Angela said, I'm going to be talking about some late breaking work, but I'm also going to be uh, talking about some slightly less late breaking work. Um, I'm going to be talking about partly some work that we are going to be presenting at CVPR this year and partly about some work that we presented at SIGGRAPH last year. So this is work that spans about a year. It's on the face of it, extremely different work, but I believe there is a coherent theme that ties it together. And that theme is the title I've chosen for this talk, Conditional Detailization. Uh, this is a new talk for me. So uh, everybody listening in right now are the guinea pigs for this talk. Uh, so please you know, forgive any uh, points of confusion or stumbles. I'd be happy to uh, clarify anything necessary after the, the main talk is over. Uh, and, and Angela, I'm not directly following the YouTube chat box. So maybe you could uh, relay any questions from there to me after the talk forward. Okay, so uh, as the name suggests, the, uh, the, the theme of this talk is to talk about ways in which we can add detail to 3D shapes conditioned on some sort of guidance. And uh, this is a pretty broad philosophical framework, and I'm going to try to fit two somewhat different projects, as I said, within this framework and uh, speculate a little bit on how we can take this idea forward in the future. And um, on the opening slide, you see a bunch of these plants. The idea is that you can take some sort of a coarse shape like the orange column on the left, and then you can take some uh, high resolution style shapes such as the green uh, high resolution uh, objects in the top row. And then you can fill in the rest of the matrix. In other words, you can upsample the coarse shapes with the detail derived from the style shapes, even though there is no direct structural correspondence between uh, a specific content shape and a specific style shape. Right? So, so that, that's the basic uh, framework within which I situate this talk. But the devil is in the details. And we'll talk about some of those details. And we'll look at some results and uh, talk about it from there. OK. So uh, let me see. A big open problem in three-dimensional geometric computing right now is the synthesis of very detailed three-dimensional shapes. Right. So uh, I, I like to set this up as a dichotomy between what we want to generate using algorithms on a computer and what we can currently generate. 
So what we want to generate are awesome looking, highly detailed, possibly textured, colored, et cetera, et cetera, shapes like those on the left. And I mean, you know, the, the, the title of this talk series is 3D GV, so I, I probably don't need my usual clarification, but I'll do it all the same. These are not meant to be images. These are meant to represent actual three-dimensional virtual objects that you can rotate, that you can relight, that you can uh, edit in uh, physical ways and so on and so forth. Right. So this is what we want to generate on the left. And uh, you will notice that these shapes are imbued with a large amount of, let's call it geometric details, such as the uh, ornamentation on the legs, the texture on the sofa, the on the back of this office chair, and so on and so forth. And what I could also call topological detail. Uh, for example, in the slats uh, in the back of the rocking chair, in the holes in the back of the plastic chair, uh, and, and various other combinations of these parts in interesting structural ways that define the overall topology of this shape. So, so many of these shapes are remarkably complicated topology. Now, on the other side, and you can guess where I'm going with this, what we can generate is nowhere near this uh, platonic ideal of uh, virtual shape generation. Here is a representative set of outputs from uh, models de developed over the last, let's say, two, three years. And uh, actually, there's a, let me be fair, it's a little more than two, three years if I look at a couple of these examples, but I think it's pretty representative of where we stand right now. And uh, these span all sorts of three-dimensional representations. There are voxel grids, there are implicit fields, there are meshes, there are point clouds, there are structural representations uh, rep represented as trees or graphs. And all of these have, compared to the stuff on the left, fairly low amounts of detail. A lot of it is very smooth. Uh, there's not much close detail. There's little topological detail. Where there is topological detail, there is a large amount of noise to counter that and make these shapes largely unusable in actual applications. Right? So you know we are getting better year by year, but we are not quite there yet in these terms. And all of these are examples of what I would call synthesized from scratch approaches. In other words, uh, there is some, in all of these cases, machine learning model, which has examined a data set of shapes, which has uh, figured out a way to take some sort of control uh, parameter vector and decode that back into uh, a complete shape. And then it defines a distribution over these parameter vectors in order to define the probabilistic structure of this shape space. Another uh, paradigm which has been explored for uh, a decade and more now is to take pre-existing parts and assemble them together. So we completely avoid the four scratch part of the examples that you just saw. And we assume that we are working with prefabricated virtual parts. And the challenge comes from just figuring out how they are put together. This particular approach is a topic that's extremely close to my heart. And uh, uh, by the way, I'm giving a talk at the Toronto Geometric Colloquium next week on precisely this topic of uh, you know, how to put parts together. But uh, this approach comes with limitations of its own. Although because the parts are prefabricated, local detail can be pretty much assumed across the board, you are limited by the fact that these parts are in fact prefabricated. So you're limited by uh, an existing data set, and you're limited by the amount of control you have in adapting that data set to your needs for particular applications. So you could synthesize from scratch, but then you're plagued by low detail and noise. You could put parts together, but then you are limited by the constraints of the data set that you're dealing with. Okay, so what can we do about this? One thing we could potentially think of doing is throwing the complete kitchen sink at this, right? And, and this is the, uh, the, the slogan of the deep learning revolution. If it doesn't work, throw uh, more data, more high resolution representations, throw bigger neural networks, throw lots and lots and lots and lots more hardware at this thing. And, um, and, and you know, sometimes this works. Um, and uh, practitioners have made the point that simple algorithms just scaled up to lots and lots and lots and lots of data often actually works quite well. However, this doesn't necessarily work for the cases that I am describing here. And there are a number of reasons related to the uh, items that are present in the first sentence. The first of all is a data problem. We don't really know where to get so much high quality 3D data. Yet 3D data sets are growing, but 
we are not quite there yet. Then there's a representation problem. Um, as you go to more and more uh, high resolution, the set of um, instantiations or, or points in that very high dimensional space that actually map to plausible shapes is uh, correspondingly smaller and smaller and smaller. So you're trying to map out this very uh, low dimensional manifold, if it's even a manifold, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure that it actually has purely manifold structure in this extremely high dimensional space. So you're not just looking for a needle in a haystack, you're looking for a very, very small needle in a very, very large haystack. Right? So the problem gets compounded as you bump up the resolution. Then uh, uh, in conjunction with this representation problem, you have the corresponding network problem. As you uh, make your model uh, larger and larger in order to deal with this higher and higher dimensional data, such huge models get harder and harder to train, at least if you treat the model as a black box and throw standard architectures at the problem. And, and finally, there's that hardware problem, right? I mean, we don't really have uh, 600 odd V100 GPUs lying around in our basement that we can just throw at any problem and solve uh, you know, hyperparameter tuning with grid search. So in these cases, I need a job at Google or, or in deference to my uh, fellow panelists, maybe I, I need a job at Microsoft, right? So, so you, you need access to these large industrial clusters in order to um, uh, apply this method with any degree of success. And uh, a good instructive example to look at uh, have been the challenges in scaling up 2D image-based generative adversarial networks over the last several years, right? So, so when GANs first came out in, I think, 2014, uh, the hope was that they could be scaled up to more and more realistic uh, outputs very quickly, even though the initial outputs were pretty blurred and uh, not entirely clear. But it took many, many years to get the algorithms to the stage that they could be trained on uh, relatively normal hardware and produce uh, the convincing deep fake like results that we see uh, these days. Okay, so just throwing the kitchen sink is not necessarily the best idea for modeling very high resolution 3D data. So in this talk, I'd like to pro propose an alternative and uh, this alternative is not entirely novel coming from me, but uh, I'm going to make an additional uh, pitch for it in the context of the recent work that we've done. And uh, this uh, approach is what I'll call detailization. So this word I think is sort of novel from my side. And initially we thought of calling it stylization, but that turned out to be a bit too vague and uh, uh, a little controversial. So we picked upon detailization as a word that uh, describes what we're trying to do better. Okay, so what is detailization? The idea is to factorize three-dimensional shape synthesis into two stages. The first is we automatically or manually create coarse geometry. And this uh, coarse uh, orange chair is an example of that. And this talk is not about this step. Um, maybe next week's talk is going to be more about this step, but, but this talk is not about that part of the, of the pipeline. However, once we have this coarse geometry, the second factor in this factorized pipeline refines it into detailed geometry like you now see on the right. Okay. So we started with some coarse scaffold and then we applied some sort of uh, secondary step in order to refine it into detailed geometry on the right. And, and now the, the beauty of this approach is that you can use coarse synthesis methods, and there are many of them, in order to solve the first part. And then you can use what I'll call detailization methods in order to solve the second part. And these can be trained independently, these can be trained jointly, these can be trained sequentially, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So, so there are, uh, this opens up a wide range of possible design choices. Uh, and, and by the way, I mean, I'd, I'd just like to mention looking forward that uh, it needn't be just a two-step process. You could continue adding detail in successive refinements. This, this starts looking a lot like the, uh, the pyramidal upsampling in modern GANs for achieving high resolution and, and so on and so forth. Anyway, so, so that, that's just an aside. Okay, so uh, in this talk, I'll specifically focus on a slight variant of the detailization problem, and I'll call this conditional detailization. And the idea is that this refinement into detailed geometry will be conditioned on an actual or implied exemplar. 
Okay. So let's look at an example of this again. Here is this chair, the same chair as you saw before. This is the course chair. And now I'm going to also provide an exemplar which is detailed and, and just harken back to the title slide where I quickly walk through this matrix completion problem. That's what I'm going to show again in a small um, Petri dish this time. Okay, so the uh, orange course shape, we'll call it for historical purposes, the content shape and the detailed green shape we'll call for historical purposes. Again, the style shape, take style with a pinch of salt and then we can form the shape, which is the product of these two, which has the core structure of the content shape and the detail structure of the style shape. Let's look at another style shape. And I really like this example because it's topologically or structurally very different from that content shape. It's not immediately obvious how to take the, uh, the, the detail from this uh, very different style shape and transfer it to the content. But it turns out that uh, one of the algorithms that I'm going to be talking about in this talk is actually able to do that quite successfully. And uh, there are a few things to note about this little matrix that I now have up on the screen. The first is that this algorithm is able to figure out not only that there are slats in the back, but that these slats should be uh, multiplied as many times as necessary in order to cover the space in, in the uh, back of the content course chair. And uh, this, this course chair has a fairly low and fairly wide back. So it needs to increase the number of horizontal slats and decrease the number of, uh, sorry, I take it back, um, increase the number of uh, vertical slats and decrease the number of horizontal slats in order to fit. There are other subtler things that are happening in this example. For example, you can, you can see how the ornamentation on the legs has been transferred uh, from the green chair to the, uh, in the first column to the yellow chair beneath it. Uh, but you can also see that there is variation in the arms of the chair. And interestingly enough, even though the first style chair actually completely lacks arms, uh, the algorithm has still figured out something meaningful to do to detailize the arms of the content chair. And, and you know, this is a product of a certain amount of joint training and a certain amount of, uh, let's call it uh, copy paste detail synthesis. And, and I'll talk more about this algorithm in detail. Okay, so um, a couple of points to note. The first of all, the style exemplar provides um, high frequency details, but may have extremely dissimilar core structure. And this is something that I've been saying over and over again, there need not be a direct topological or structural correspondence between the style and content shapes. And uh, secondly, this is one version of a general problem that is known by many names and has been studied in many domains across the uh, 3D geometric computing space. Uh, it's been called stylization, it's been called shape analogies, it's been called style transfer. These different variants often vary in uh, terms of exactly how the condition for stylization or detailization is specified and exactly how we define style, for example, in shape analogies, you are given three uh, objects and you're asked to hallucinate a fourth, rather than in this case, where you're given two objects and asked to hallucinate a third, and, and so on and so forth. So the, so the setup can vary slightly, but the, 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 high, uh, the high level goal remains roughly the same. Right. So, so I'm, I'm going to link to all of these. And if I don't explicitly make the link, feel free to make these uh, mental links yourself. All right, awesome. So let me propose one possible way in which we could uh, achieve conditional detailization. Right? And, and I'm bringing this up more as a sort of uh, straw man or baseline rather than as the final methods that I'll talk about. This is a, a paper we presented as an oral at CVPR uh, last year. And uh, the, the title of this paper is Neural Cages. Uh, you may or may not have come across it. But the general idea is that we defined a way to take, a, let's call it style shape and deform it in a detail preserving way in order to fit the general contours of uh, let's call it content shape. So again, we have a little matrix in each of these figures. The left one is chairs, the right one is humans. Um, do note that uh, the rows and columns are flipped with respect to the, the previous matrices that you've seen. So, so please make that adjustment in your head. Uh, I couldn't re-render these for this talk. Uh, but the, the, the fairly complex and highly detailed style shapes in the columns this time are 
quite nicely non-homogeneously deformed to, to look sort of like the content shapes without uh, losing any of their fine detail. And this is achieved by a neural network that infers the optimal parameters of a low dimensional cage-based transform that preserves fine details. So we made a link between uh, you know, the, the bleeding edge of neural networks and extremely traditional geometric deformation methods. But this clearly doesn't solve the detailization problem that um, we'd like to solve here because the topology or the structure of the content shape is completely ignored. So the example that I showed in the previous slide would be completely impossible to do with this approach. Uh, it couldn't hallucinate arms out of nowhere, for example, or couldn't do the duplication of the slats that was necessary in order to achieve a plausible wider back, for example, right? So we want to transfer just these geometric and topological details. We don't want to uh, wholesale import the macro structure of the style shape as well. Right? So, so something more is needed. OK. So I'm going to talk about two approaches for conditional detailization with neural networks. And um, sorry, one second. Yeah. The first one is to train an upsampling network and, and, and detailization is an, a sort of another word for upsampling after a fashion. To train an upsampling network with just one style exemplar. So the shape that we have provided as the style of the detail to be transferred is part of the training data. It's not just part of the training data, it is the training data because we train with literally nothing else. We're going to train a network that grossly overfits to this one single training exam exemplar, right? And, and once we finish doing this, the detail parameters will be captured in the weights of the network. And, and you know, this is a idea which has been explored in many different domains in the recent past. Uh, for example, uh, the, the hubbub about NERF, for example, uh, is, is about a network which is uh, frozen to a particular scene. So the details of the scene are actually in the weights of that network uh, and you have to retrain the network in order to represent a different scene. And this, this constraint has actually been relaxed in very, very recent work. But uh, we are familiar with this notion that uh, high resolution detail is captured in the weights of the network rather than being an, an external condition. And in this context, I'm going to talk about a paper on a conditional mesh upsampling that we uh, presented at SIGGRAPH last year. And uh, this is called neural subdivision. And that's, that's going to be the first part of what I talk about. And uh, the second thing that I'm going to talk about is to train, again, an upsampling network, but a very different one with an unpaired collection of content and style shapes. So this time, we're going to do a fair degree of joint training. But the detail parameters will be captured by external codes that are assigned to the style shapes, assigned by the network. So it learns what codes to assign to these different style shapes. And the same learned network refines each content shape conditioned on a style code, right? So, so this is a standard conditional GAN uh, with, with some architectural tweaks. Uh, and I'll talk about those architectural tweaks in a bit. And, and this is a paper called Decor GAN, 3D uh, Detailization by Conditional Refinement. And, and this is uh, the late breaking work that uh, Angela talked about. We'll be uh, presenting this at CBTR uh, this year. And I'm going to try to build some connections uh, between these two works. And I'd just like to note in passing that both these approaches are uh, self-supervised. Uh, in, in large part, so uh, they actually rely on extremely little annotation, and, and that's uh, pretty nice. You can, you can get away with less work and still achieve pretty nice results. Okay, so uh, first I'm going to talk about this work called Neural Subdivision, and uh, our goal is to refine a coarse mesh. So in this case, the 3D shape will be represented by a polygon mesh, or more specifically in this case, a triangle mesh while preserving and hallucinating the necessary details, right? So we'll go from some very coarse resolution mesh, and then we'll upsample it by a process of uh, recursive refinement. And in each step, we are going to try to either preserve detail that we can already detect is there in the coarse shape, or hallucinate it if we think it should be there because of a data prior. Now, the standard way to refine measures, measures in a, in a topo topology preserving way is mesh subdivision. And this is the, the 
the uh, bread and butter of techniques like subdivision surfaces. So I'll just walk you through that very quickly. This is classic geometric computing. There is nothing remotely cutting edge or neural networky about this, but it's the bread and butter of uh, huge amounts of 3D content creation pipelines. And, and the idea is as follows. You start with a coarse mesh like the polyhedron you see on the bottom left, and then you repeatedly subdivide each of its triangular faces into four new triangles. And uh, the, the, uh, the beauty of the scheme comes in figuring out exactly where the vertices of these new triangles go. Right? So uh, there are each triangle has three vertices. Once you add uh, 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 once you, once you convert it into uh, four triangles, now you have uh, six vertices and now you need to figure out where these three new vertices go and should the old three vertices be moved around a bit or not. There are many classic schemes for this. Uh, a very standard policy is what's called loop subdivision, which is this uh, single triangle to four triangle scheme that I mentioned earlier, coupled with this repositioning scheme, which uh, computes the position of each new vertex as a weighted sum of the vertices surrounding it. So this is a very, very standard pipeline. It's been studied for decades, uh, but there is a downside. And this downside is uh, that classical subdivision is explicitly designed to blur out high frequency detail. So uh, if this is a talk about detailization, subdivision on the face of it seems like exactly the wrong way to go about it because it's trying to smooth out detail for, because it's, it's, it's trying to represent smooth surfaces which are required for games, movies, uh, CAD, and so on, but with fairly coarse representations. And the, the, the theoretical limit for many of these subdivision schemes is that this uh, symmetric polyhedron actually converges to a sphere or something very close to a sphere if you keep on subdividing, subdividing, and so on. OK, so what can we do? And, and what we can do is to uh, look at this problem slightly differently. So, so here is a coarse mesh. Here is the high resolution ground truth that uh, we know exists uh, when we're evaluating different methods. And here is the output of different classical subdivision, subdivision schemes. Right? So, so uh, on the left is what's called the midpoint subdivision scheme, which uh, doesn't really do much. The uh, higher resolution mesh on the bottom left pretty much looks like the coarse mesh uh, that we were given as input. Then there's loop subdivision, which you just uh, saw briefly. And there's another scheme called modified butterfly. These are either all over smoothed or they have serious problems at the more high curvature regions. But the key idea that we had is, can we learn a data-driven subdivision operator? In other words, we are going to look at some sort of training exemplar or exemplars and infer from that how to take coarse geometry and subdivide it to get high resolution geometry. And the result of learning this data-driven subdivision operator is what you see in blue. We started with that coarse input, and then we applied our subdivision scheme uh, a couple of times, and we get, got something that is pretty close to the ground truth. Now, there are some fairly interesting things happening here, which may not be completely obvious. First of all, the, this bunny is the only training exemplar for the neural network that underlies this subdivision scheme. And so it's trained on just one exemplar. Secondly, this bunny doesn't appear to have anything to do with the category of this mechanical part that I just um, upsampled. It turns out that this is perhaps surprisingly not such a huge restriction. As long as your exemplar has a nice mix of uh, high and low resolution detail and some, some broad uh, geometric features, uh, I'm, I'm abusing the word features here, it can serve as a pretty good template for this um, subdivision, this, this learned subdivision scheme. But let's look at that in a little more detail. And it's, it's incorrect to say that you can just throw any training exemplar at this uh, pipeline and expect to get the same robust results every time. The output is sensitive to the choice of training exemplar or exemplars. And, and in this little example, you'll see that we're given this extremely coarse uh, windy tube-like structure in the middle. Um, and if you train it with the mechanical parts on the top left, you get something with hard edges when you subdivide and upsample it on the bottom left. But if you train it with the smoother shapes on the top right, then you get something that is smooth when you upsample it. 
right? So, so um, again, the smooth shapes don't really fit a single category, but they're all sort of smooth. And this is what I meant by, uh, as long as they follow certain broad geometric characteristics, the network is relatively agnostic to the exact choice of shape category that you provide as an exemplar. Okay, so this slide also, but, but, this, but the point I'd like to make with the slide is also that the output is conditional on the training data. So we do achieve a type of detailization or detail preserving upsampling that is sensitive to this condition of the exemplar that we've trained with. All right, so what's the method? Our method is as follows. So, and remember, this is a self-supervised pipeline, so uh, we don't have any additional annotations. We start with this high resolution mesh, which we are going to train on, and then we decimate it using standard geometric methods to make it coarser and coarser and coarser. And this is how we create our training data. Right? So this is the decimation step that takes us from the green elephant on the left to the coarse gray elephant in the middle. And then we learn a local upsampling operator, which is our learned subdivision scheme. And, and this subdivides that coarse mesh repeatedly over and over again to give you that uh, blue elephant on the right. And now you can see that this sort of looks like an encoder and a decoder with this coarse shape being the bottleneck shape in the middle. So we can train this whole thing with a reconstruction loss uh, and uh, hope that the network parameters that are there in our subdivision scheme will get optimized accordingly to uh, make sure that the shape on the right is a good approximation for the shape on the left, even though we started with that coarse shape in the middle. Right. So, so this is uh, a dimensionality reduction problem, just like we study in autoencoders, except it's framed in the language of uh, very, very classical geometric decimation and subdivision schemes. Okay, so um, I, I'd also like to point out that this subdivision scheme that I'm going to be talking about has a completely deterministic topology update. It is the exact same topology update as loop subdivision. One triangle gets replaced with uh, four small triangles, but the vertex positions are figured out by a neural network. And so, so the where the vertices of these new triangles go is something that is learned. Okay, so here's the network pipeline. I am omitting the initialization step, which assigns certain features to the vertices of the coarse mesh that is given as input. And you know, this is this is uh, relatively less important detail. But um, the each each iteration of subdivision has two components, and throughout the pipeline, these two components alternate. Right. So there's what we call a vertex step. Then there's an edge step. So you go vertex edge, vertex edge, vertex edge, and so on. And the vertex step updates the features at uh, the, uh, the new, uh, the, the old vertices and the edge step updates the features at the uh, new vertices. And, and it just goes back and forth between these two. Right. And um, I, I probably don't have too much time to talk about the details of this uh, setup in, in uh, at, 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 at great length, but uh, let me mention a couple of things. First of all, this is a mesh, uh, a sort of mesh convolutional network, but the in quotes convolutional kernels are defined on a structure that uh, we can call half flaps, which consists of uh, an edge and the triangle immediately adjacent to it. And we can take each of these triangles, these are oriented, we can define local uh, coordinate frames and local features. And then we can perform an aggregation of the, the features from the previous uh, subdivision step, as well as the latest geometric information with a little kernel that operates on this oriented triangle and get some uh, feature response from that by passing it through this pretty small little network module. We do this for all of these half flaps that are incident on the vertex for which we are trying to compute a new feature. Then we do average pooling over these different feature responses. And that is the, uh, the, the final feature of this uh, the vertex that we compute. So we do something very similar on the right as well in the edge step. And, and in this alternating fashion, we keep updating the features on this mesh as it gets progressively refined over and over and over again. So um, uh, some among you will uh, notice that this is a recursive scheme, and it's uh, closely related to an existing framework called recursive neural networks, which has been applied to images, which we've applied to 3D shapes as well. Um, 
this is uh, so, so if recurrent neural networks are ways to encode chain structured sequences, recursive neural networks are ways to, uh, to, to um, encode hierarchies or trees. So in this case, uh, you can think of the coarse mesh as the root of this tree, and then each of the faces gets subdivided to give you uh, several more child nodes, and then another process of subdivision creates more child nodes. So you're basically building this tree structured object, and you're using this same network modules applied at each of these steps in order to figure out what each successive level of this tree looks like. like so, so this is uh, a pretty straightforward recursive neural net with two alternating network modules shared across all the levels. OK, so um, that's the basic network pipeline that allows us to, at each stage, predict what the vertex positions are after one round of topological subdivision. But if you try to train this pipeline end to end with an autoencoder like reconstruction loss between that high resolution step, so there's a shape that we know exists, and this uh, subdivided result that we've obtained from our course shape, uh, it turns out it doesn't work too well if you use standard losses. So if you train this with, let's say, chamfer loss, you get extremely noisy results like you see on the right because chamfer loss is well known to not be topologically, uh, to, to be topology preserving. There have been many uh, schemes proposed to work around this, this, you know, this classical shortcoming of chamfer loss. Uh, we are going to propose one more and our loss allows the training to proceed in a very nice and clean way, giving the results that you see on the right. But let me talk about the details in a little, uh, a little bit. And the, the, the high level idea is that as we decimate the high resolution shape on the left using a deterministic method, and then subdivided repeatedly using a neural network in order to reconstruct something looking like that high resolution shape back, we are going to maintain a bijective correspondence, a bijective mapping between all of these shapes so that we can say this point on the final result maps back to this point on the original high resolution shape and their positions should be identical. So at that point, we can apply essentially an L2 loss, right? But this, this dense correspondence between the final shape and the input shape is what's important. And again, we are going to apply completely classical geometric methods for this. You know, there's, there's no fancy neural network based stuff. Um, and this, this works quite well. So maintaining this bijective mapping during subdivision is fairly straightforward. We just uh, express each point in terms of its barycentric coordinates in the parent triangle. So when you subdivide, you create a new vertex, you just assign to it the barycentric coordinates uh, that it would have in the old triangle that it started from, and you keep the map going in this fashion, right? As, as just barycentric coordinates, barycentric coordinates, barycentric coordinates, and so on. So that's the easy part. The harder part is maintaining uh, this bijective mapping between the high resolution shape and the decimated shape that we constructed as self-supervision. And, and this requires some tricky uh, local parameterizations. I don't have the time to go into this in detail. Uh, please refer to the paper for more details. But the general idea is that we can take a low dimensional neighborhood and a high dimensional neighborhood, which correspond to the same semantic region on the shape. We can flatten both down onto uh, the plane, onto the 2D plane using you know, some, some standard parametrization scheme, like you know, conformal flattening or something. And, and then uh, with these two regions overlapped, uh, overlaid one on top of each other, now you just uh, make the overlapping points correspond to each other, right? So, so this is a bijective mapping achieved through local parametrizations in each little local region across these uh, different shapes, right? And, and we need to do this because uh, the decimation scheme is not as topologically nice as the subdivision scheme. So we, we update these little local parametrizations after each edge collapse that we use to decimate the mesh from high resolution to coarse resolution. Okay, so let's look at some results. So here is uh, an example of two levels of subdivision in a detail preserving way, conditioned on that single training exemplar that you see on the left. Again, this training exemplar, exemplar and the shape being upsampled come from uh, very different uh, 
well, sort of different categories, they're still organic shapes. Um, but you can see that there's some interesting stuff happening here. First of all, the over smoothing that would be there with classical schemes is completely absent. But at the same time, the noise that you would expect with classical schemes is also absent, right? Depending on which classical scheme you choose. Uh, it also preserves high frequency detail in some cases hallucinates this detail pretty well if you look at the nose or the eyes of this uh, gorilla. And, and presumably it's making some connections to the nose and the eyes of the centaur or the bottom left. But uh, you know, it's, it's pretty remarkable that it does this at all. And um, I'd also like to point out that our networks are incredibly local. They're essentially just looking at wandering neighborhoods at each level of subdivision. So the fact that it still manages to do something intelligent is actually pretty nice. Uh, I, there is obvious future work to do in which you increase the field of view of these kernels and get some more global reasoning into this structure. Uh, you know, we haven't done it yet. Uh, it's, it's on our to-do list, but uh, it's uh, pretty nice that we can get away just by looking at wandering neighborhoods and two levels of uh, recursive network. Okay, here's another example. Uh, so all of the coarse shapes on the top are upsampled using just the bunny on the bottom left. And again, um, you see that you know smooth regions are preserved smoothly. Uh, high detail regions are upsampled again in a nice way. And um, I, I probably should have had comparisons to the classical baselines up here, but but take it from me that uh, it would not look nearly as nice uh, as as these examples do. Okay, um, and, and here's an example where we add what is perhaps more readily identifiable as high frequency detail. So we gave it some training shapes, uh, which have either high frequency edges or some noise or green and, and, and so on and so forth. And um, it does some interesting things when transferring the when, when when transferring this detail to the course exemplar using this little learned subdivision module. Right, so the, the fine unstructured grain gets transfer, transferred fairly well. The sphere example is a clear problem because it, it doesn't just make everything blown up like a balloon. It creates these little sphere, uh, spherical patches. Uh, a sphere gives it nothing to work with, right? It doesn't know the difference between low curvature and high curvature regions and how to treat them differently if you just give it a sphere. And if you give it a hard-edged training example, then it will create hard-edged subdivided output as we've seen in previous slides too. Okay, so the problem here in the limitations that I identified is that the network is too local to capture detail with more complicated long range structure. And this brings me nicely to the second part of what I'm going to talk about. I'm uh, going to present some recent work which works with a very different shape representation and a very different network, but manages to add detail of a much higher degree of complexity to shapes. Um, but to do this, it needs to do a certain amount of joint training on a larger collection of content and style shapes. However, this collection will be completely unpaired. So again, there'll be a degree of self-supervision in the training. I'll very quickly go over the network architecture that lets us uh, achieve this. And this time, instead of having a single style shape provided as the style exemplar during training, we are going to train on a bunch of shapes, but then provide the style of the detail as an external code to our overall framework, just like a conditional GAN. This is a conditional GAN. Okay, so um, our approach is called Decor GAN. It operates on voxel grids instead of meshes. Uh, this allows it to more easily handle topological uh, changes, as you'll see in some pretty extreme examples um, coming up. Um, so the idea is that we take a coarse shape, which is a 64 cubed grid, and then we'll upsample it to a 256 cubed uh, higher resolution shape, but we'll do this conditioned on a detailed shape as you've seen in all the examples in the past, right? So, so you've seen this plant example, but I'd like to talk about this plant example a little bit because uh, we are pretty happy with the way this particular one turned out and has some interesting features that I think are quite relevant. Okay, so uh, the first is that unlike most, uh, 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 unlike most neural geometry processing pipelines, uh, this pipeline seems to work quite well, even if you mix organic and man-made data with the same trained network. 
right? You don't need to retrain it. You can give it a shape which combines man-made parts like the stuff at the bottom of these plants and the organic parts, which is the rest of the plant. And it'll do pretty much the right thing in both cases when doing upsampling. So if you look at how the flower pots are scaled up, you look at the coarse orange flower pot and then how it's scaled up to the detailed uh, yellow flower pots, it's sort of doing the right thing. It's synthesizing the layout of these uh, flower pots. It's synthesizing two flower pots when it needs to, et cetera, et cetera. It's varying the heights according to what it's seen in the exemplars. But at the same time, it is also doing a pretty decent job of the leaves, of the stems. I mean, there are some obvious connection problems if you squint closely, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's doing a pretty plausible job. And the arrangement of the leaves in the output is nothing like the arrangement of the leaves in the input, except as this sort of high level style. So um, this is uh, a particularly illustrative result in my view. I'm going to just talk very, very briefly about the architecture that makes this possible. Uh, this is a conditional patch GAN, uh, but, but with some tweaks here and there. Uh, one of the, and, and this is the entire training setup. So there's, there's a lot more here than you'll see at test time. Uh, there is a detailed shape that is passed to the, the overall model. That's the one that I've highlighted with the blue box on the left. There's a course shape, which is also provided during training, but these two are unpaired. There does not need to be any bijective correspondence or any other sort of correspondence between the course and the detailed shapes, though in our, all our examples, we did ensure that they were from the same uh, semantic category. So chairs and chairs, plants and plants, tables and tables, airplanes and airplanes, and so on. Okay, so now we add some self-supervision by downsampling the detail shape to the resolution of the course shape, right? So we go from 256 uh, voxels aside to 64 voxels aside, and then we map this detail shape to a latent code, which will be learned by our network. So the loss is going to be back propagated all the way back to learning this latent code in an auto decoder style, um, in an auto decoder fashion. Okay, so, so now that we have this detail shape, a coarse shape, and the detail shape down sampled to a coarse shape, we are going to part, sorry, excuse me. Um, let's see if my annotations are visible here. We are going to pass them through this um, uh, GAN generator to upsample each one of these coarse shapes back to high resolution. So this is what we have here. Right? Ignore the masked part for a moment. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But now we can apply a reconstruction loss for the core, for the detail shape because we know exactly what the course uh, equivalent of that should be upsampled to. Right. So here's our detail shape. We downsampled it to course shape. The GAN generator should just upsample it back to the same detail shape when combined with the latent code that corresponds to itself. Right. So, so this is just me. You know, sort of standard self sufficient method. But what happens to this course shape, which we are passing through the same generator with the same latent style code to obtain some sort of upsampled output? Right? Well, that's where the rest of the GAN comes in. So now we pass this through a patch GAN discriminator, which says the following As I sweep over this uh, upsampled result, I want each patch of a certain window size on this result to resemble uh, a statistical, or to, to, to fit the statistics of patches that I've seen in my uh, detail shape. And, and we are going to define these statistics in the standard GAN framework, right? So we're going to give it real patches that it sees from the detail shape. We are going to give it fake patches that it's obtained by upsampling. And we're going to apply the standard adversarial loss uh, in order to uh, learn this distribution in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Right? We also apply a global GAN loss. And, and there are many boxes here that say mask, 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 mask. We apply those in order to focus the attention of the network in the regions we know it needs to focus on because we have perfect background foreground segmentation here. So we basically apply a dilated foreground mask in order to uh, you know, work in the necessary spots and ignore what happens outside it because we can always mask that out. But, but this is the general framework. It's a masked conditional patch GAN, uh, which we train with self-supervision with unpaired high resolution and low resolution shapes. And uh, I don't have too much time, so I'm going to quickly jump ahead to results. So here is an example of matrix completion on chairs with high resolution style chairs on the top and low resolution uh, content chairs in the left column. 
And you can see that the network is doing all sorts of interesting things in hallucinating the topology that is needed in order to transfer the style detail to the, uh, to the content scaffolds. And there are obvious connection errors that again, you can see if you squint, but again, it's, it is, it's not uh, what the doc says, but the fact that it speaks at all. So it's, it's quite remarkable how these topological changes are happening um, in ways that we could not achieve with prior methods uh, operating in, in, uh, on, on such data. So um, let's look at a few more examples. Here are uh, another set of chairs, but these ones are actually the output of a generative network. So these weren't coarse shapes that we obtained from some um, human design data set. These are all outputs of um, a standard low resolution um, GAN. This is, uh, well, I shouldn't say low resolution, uh, lower detail GAN, this is an implicit field based generator. And again, the network does a pretty good job in upsampling it to uh, both of the styles that you see here. Uh, let's look at these tables. Again, same, some of the same features that you saw in the previous examples. Uh, I particularly like uh, looking at what happens with the legs in this column where this, uh, these little nodules get multiplied as you go down the legs or these little um, uh, ornamental features get nicely transferred to the style shapes. The curvature of these legs gets transferred even when you do some wild uh, affine distortions uh, in order to get to the content shape. And, and finally, let's note that as a detailization method should be, it's extremely good at preserving the very fine detail that you see in the legs of uh, this style um, style table, right? So, so that's uh, these are all sort of nice features of our method. Have some airplanes. The airplanes class is probably a bit less interesting. Um, uh, this is one I like particularly. Here are low resolution motorbikes upsampled to fit the style of high resolution motorbikes. Uh, you can see that these motorbikes are actually quite different, and the network is doing a pretty good job at synthesizing what, unless you really, really look closely, appears to be plausible wheel and engine detail. And uh, again, nice things, the wheels remain circular, the engines remain you know, fitting in the right places, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's doing a pretty good job. OK, so we did a bunch of studies to va validate that our method works. Uh, we did a bunch of ablations. The um, uh, box here shows the hyperparameter settings that inform our final model that we propose. Uh, all the other uh, yellow shapes show other combinations of design choices, uh, which lead to inferior results. Uh, there are some quantitative results on top. Our method actually doesn't max out all the quantitative results, but it's a nice trade-off between the different uh, metrics and measures and considerations in the design space. Okay, um, we did design a little interactive UI that lets you explore this space of detail exemplars in an interactive way. So the shape is getting detailized in real time on the left. The rendering is pretty awful because we are doing you know, this is a pretty simplistic uh, real time ray tracing. So uh, if you render that with a nice renderer, you get the better quality uh, visualizations that we saw in the yellow shapes in the previous uh, examples. But um, this gives you an idea of what the detail space looks like. Um, so the shapes on the right are embedded in terms of the similarity of detail, not their similarity of, uh, uh, of, of gross topology, right? so, uh, or not just the similarity of the gross topology. OK, so let me conclude. Uh, I argued, or at least I started to argue, that detailization is a broad framework for adding high resolution detail to coarse shapes in a factored user guided manner. And you know, this is the general theme that we are exploring with all of these works. Uh, there are some open problems. Uh, can we jointly train coarse synthesis and detailization either sequentially or uh, with some sort of factored pre-training and then joint training and so on and so forth? How can we better capture long range detail patterns that have traditionally been represented with procedures or grammars uh, and so on? These are you know, hell for uh, a statistical method like a neural net to capture because they are so tightly constrained. Uh, which domains are amenable to detailization? Is that 3D shapes or can you apply it to a variety of other domains as well as the same paradigm apply? Uh, what sort of conditioning is suitable for different tasks, both in terms of uh, quantitative results and friendliness to human designers? And can we extend this to other 3D representations? Uh, some question that I'm particularly interested in is, uh, how can we explicitly add topological or structural details? So uh, Decorgan, for example, synthesizes 
voxelized topological detail pretty well, but it's doing it all implicitly in the bowels of the network. And as a result, there are uh, connection problems and other uh, topological problems that we might be able to address with an explicit uh, structural representation. And uh, could we apply these ideas to other uh, hot off the press intermediate 2D, 3D representations like nerves and, and so on. And so this is, this is something that uh, might be useful to think about. Okay, all of this work is made possible by the awesome student authors. We just support them and you know, uh, they, they go do their thing and come back with uh, wonderful results. So uh, a big shout out to Derek Krishichin and Ifan who are the lead authors of the uh, three papers that I presented here. Uh, neural subdivision, Decorgan, and I briefly talked about detail preserving uh, neural cage based 3D deformations. So please do check out these papers and I'd be happy to um, discuss anything you would like in a more uh, informal setting now. So, uh, Angela, back to you and the panel. Okay, so thanks, Sid, for a really great talk. Um, we're going to open up now with our uh, panelists. Um, so we have su with us Sudipta and uh, Gauli. Um, let me just unmute you guys so you can speak. Yes, very, very nice work and uh, I learned a lot. And uh, I, I think it's a very clever way to to train the network use the, using the unsupervised manner, especially for the neural subdivision. I, I like the idea because I think it's very difficult to use the uh, human effort to give some human labor. While in this work, we can simplify the mesh and use the simplify mesh and the dense mesh and build the correspondence. And then we can learn learn them in the unsupervised manner. It's a very, very good idea. I think this this would this will be the inspire the future direction because for the 3D data, it is very difficult for people to make some label. While we can use some uh, algorithm to generate the pair, and we can use the network to learn the pair to improve the efficiency and to improve the result. I think this is very, very, very uh, clever idea. And uh, also that I think the second work is very, uh, the digitalization, it also will inspire the future work because here we give a shape with a, uh, a given shape and maybe inspire me, we can give some label. Maybe this is uh, in the Europe style or Chinese style for a chair. And uh, maybe uh, I, I think uh, this, this work is the beginning. <laughs> I can imagine this will inspire a lot of future work. Yeah, this is, this is my thinking, <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks so much, Gao. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I I completely concur with your points about uh, reducing annotation effort. So I, I give a separate talk, which I've given like several times now on on weak supervision for you know classical geometry processing problems, uh, segmentation, correspondences, um, uh, synthesis, and so on. And in all of these cases, we are trying to see how little supervision we can get away with. Um, these methods are are nice in that they're almost completely unsupervised, but sometimes you need a little bit of a push in the right direction. But the question is how little a push you can get. Away with and and uh, you know your your point is absolutely appropriate that I think a, a lot of work in three especially in three D uh, geometric computing needs to focus on reducing supervision because annotation seems to be bloody hard uh, you know I mean we've done a lot of annotation work ourselves I know that in your work you've done you know a bunch of annotation work as well and I, I think. Uh, it's it seems to be harder than getting annotations for images for a variety of reasons and uh, yeah and the less we can get away with the better for us i think yes yeah yeah so yeah i agree with uh, uh, Gao. uh yeah this is really uh, interesting but very intuitive um so siddharth uh, had a question about the neural subdivision um technique the that particular paper so it looks like you have a single exemplar, and if I understand correctly, the neural network is trained on this single exemplar. So when you showed an example where you had um, one shape uh, and four different exemplars, so that means yeah. that you are training four different neural networks. Uh, do you mean this one? 
Um, or we actually mean four different exemplars. One second. Yes, uh, it was basically uh, this I one. think the. Uh, no, no, I think it was the other one actually, where you had um, was it the. Right here, actually. Yeah. Uh, well, okay, yeah. This that, exactly. that, 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 that's yeah, four yeah. different neural networks. Yes, that's four, four different, different neural, neural, neural same networks. architecture, different weights. Right, right, and um, so basically, it means that you could to to actually use this method in practice. You, you know, the the applying the neural network of that shape is really fast. So you could basically have a whole bunch of these that you train offline. You know, you could have a hundred different neural networks which capture different statistics. You may not know which one will produce the right answer, but applying them on a new that gray shape is fast, correct? Absolutely. So, so basically, it means that you you can now just apply those those uh, like you know your collection of generators, and then if you if it's a human in the loop design process, still like have a human pick the one they like, right? So yeah. what I'm saying is that it seems that there's something nice about this approach that, you know, if these neural networks are just trained on different exemplars and they capture different aspects of the underlying shapes, you could still apply them on a, on a new um, gray model, on a new, new uh, course model and produce interesting results out of which one of them might be the one you care about. Yeah, yeah, you're. I mean, you're completely right. Uh, I, I think that you know, uh, this is one way to define a variety of 3D neural filters, uh, right. and um, because this is exemplar driven, the user could just provide their own exemplar and add a little filter to the toolkit. Um, there are some downs. There's some pros and cons of this. So, so the 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 pro is what you mentioned. Plus, the network is so small. Uh, because it, it necessarily has to be somewhat capacity constrained to do anything meaningful at all. Uh, the network is so small that you could pretty much tune it by hand if you wanted to. So if you're not entirely happy with the results and you had some time to spare, you can actually go in and maybe this will require a little bit of UI work, but, but you could sort of play with the weights of the network in order to better approach the results that you want, or you could fine tune it in, in meaningful ways. Um, I see. The, the, the downside is that this network is so small and easily trainable and fits well to single shapes because it is limited, right? So if you wanted to uh, have, have filters that synthesize more complex types of detail, um, like, like for example, a repeating pattern uh, with, with a regular structure, this is going to be pretty bad at, at, at doing that because it has no notion of uh, its global position in the overall shapes. So if you just wanted to say, synthesize a bump every one, one centimeter, that would actually be difficult to do without changing the network. So up to a point, yes. If you're interested in subdivision or just adding certain types of noise or uh, you know, simple cases like that, I, I use the word simple with, with caution because you know, nothing simple here, but um, then, then I think it would work, but not, but, but to make it more general, you'd need to do more, yeah. Got it, yeah. I had another question in re relation to this at work. I was thinking, so everything was done in the, in the framework of subdivision surfaces and mm -hmm. meshes, but have you thought of applying it to other representations? Would there be a way to still kind of follow the same motivation of self-supervision? Um, I don't know, maybe voxelization. I was thinking like with this work with, is there something fundamentally different about working do, doing this with meshes? There, there is nothing fundamentally different though. It, de it depends on where, you know, where, where your baseline for fundamental is, right? Um, so for example, with, with voxels, there are uh, existing work, not from us, uh, on uh, iteratively refining voxelized output. Right? Both in terms of going from you know 16 cube to 32 cube to 64 cube and and so on, and also on doing it in in an adaptive way. And and these are what are called octree networks. Uh, and and there, there is work from at least two different groups which explore many different aspects of this problem, uh, both the discriminative and generative octree type models. Uh, and uh, there are versions that these folks have explored which are pretty close to what we are doing here, except. Uh, you know, transferred to the to the to the voxel space. Now, uh, 
this this work is i mean in terms of its input representations is closer to our uh, decorgan paper but mm. uh, we haven't really done like a, like a direct head to head comparison uh, to see if we could directly apply the ideas in octree networks in in our decorgan framework um, okay. so yeah you know I, I, but but yes i mean the short answer is uh this idea has been explored octree networks are probably the most direct reference and there's adaptive octrees uh, conditional etc etc okay. and chola has something to say i think for i don't know it's a very fact interrupted um, uh, no no it's okay I, yeah. I was still mentally thinking going back to what you mentioned about the tuning the weights of the network mm -hmm. by hand to adjust the output mm -hmm. um but how big of a network are we talking about here now? Like on the order of magnitude of number of parameters that we're discussing? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I'm actually trying to remember what we finally ended up with, but it's it's uh, it's, it's off the order of hundreds, I think. That's it. Hundreds of parameters that we're yeah, talking I about. Yeah, I think so, yeah. But even yeah. for hundreds I, 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 of parameters- I might, I might, I might uh, end up with egg on my face if, if my memory is, is not serving me correctly. But let's say but also it's thousands is- yeah. yeah, but it's not millions. Let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah. Um, but how intuitive is it to actually go back and tweak each of these individual parameters? Because these individual parameters have no meaning. So, and also could propagate in many uh, unexpected ways, right? Absolutely. So it's completely unintuitive. It's completely unintuitive. And, and that's what I tried to uh, sort of hint at in my response to Shudipto that, uh, you know, it's, uh, you need some sort of uh, UI innovation before this becomes feasible. Or, or you need to be like more incredibly motivated and expert in, in order to do this, right? So uh, I, I'm just saying that the networks are small enough that this is within the realms of possibility, which okay. for a large CNN, for example, is, is clearly not possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, I see, okay. Got it, yeah. Or, or uh, let me put it a different way. Uh, maybe you're not the user. Maybe you are uh, somebody building a uh, filter for some, you know, it's a 3D version of Photoshop, right? Uh, you're an engineer who is getting paid to tune the parameters of this network to achieve the results you want, and you're allowed to spend a week at it, and you'll be paid some you know, large amount of money to do it. Uh, okay. That person can probably, you know, pull this off. Okay, uh, okay. Whereas with a more complex network, this sort of low level tuning would not be possible. You might be able to do some sort of high level disentangled uh, optimization of the parameters, but you couldn't you know, go in and play with the weights and see what, what would happen. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on how to enforce, I have two related questions. One was basically why the masking is necessary um, which I'm guessing is related to your topology, my guess is. And also the second is if you have any thoughts on how to enforce topology to ensure that certain connections still remain. Um, for instance, I could imagine in some extreme stylizations, these legs of the chairs are no longer attached or so on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the masking is basically just a way for the network to focus its capacity in a meaningful way. So you could just look at our ablation study perhaps. And if you look at B, uh, which has no generator mask and D, which has no discriminator mask, right? These two, mm -hmm. uh, the, the version in B is actually pretty decent. If you, if you compare it to our final result, which is K, uh, down here. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I'm comparing this thing in B with this thing in K. Um, without a mask, it's not bad, but it's distinctly improved if you use a mask. And our conclusion is basically that the network is learning to uh, use its capacity in the foreground region without bothering to zero out the background region, basically. Okay, I see, I see. And now the, the second question is, I mean, also a very, very uh, interesting question. I, okay, this is, uh, and then now, now I'm sort of going to go out on a limb. I'm not super sanguine about adding topological annotations to pure voxelized input, right? So personally, I would rather start with a structural representation from the beginning where each component in the structural graph could have a voxelized representation. So you know, the back of the chair is voxelized or the slat, each slat in the chair is voxelized, but, but it's, a, it's a unit by itself. And then the network learns to uh, detailize a shape by basically refining its structural graph. 
And, and, and that's how I'd go about adding topological detail in a structured aware way where I could explicitly enforce things like connections must be maintained, uh, symmetry between different uh, structural units must be maintained and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we talk a little bit about this in a, uh, in a state of the art report that we uh, published at Eurographics last year, which is, which is entirely about structure aware synthesis. Um, and and you know, these are the sort of models that uh, I'm quite interested in. And I think that you know, uh, would, would, uh, you know, the, the right way to go about this problem. Uh, and I talk about a little bit in the conclusion. So um, the second last point is how can we more explicitly add topological structural detail? And, and what I meant there is exactly what you what you uh, brought up as well. Um, so I, I wouldn't try hacking this network in order to add topological consistency. I'd probably start from scratch and uh, use some sort of graph-based structural model. But it's much harder, right? So, so uh, and and so we started with voxels first. I see. I see. Yeah, maybe I returned, I interjected with all my own questions, but uh, maybe I returned the floor to our panelists. <laughs> yeah, these are all great questions. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have still have a question and uh, I, I find for the subdivision, we know that for the uh, lights, the subdivision or loops subdivision, there are some, there are, there is some guarantee that we can get the smoothness, uh, such as C2 smoothness or C1 smoothness. Uh, I think there is some guarantee for the smoothness. So for the neural subdivision, because it learned from data, so could we get some something about this? Oh, that, that that's a that's a really really nice question. Um, okay, so so the first of all, the answer is I don't have a clue, right? Uh, and and I, I I wish I I knew the answer to that, but it's it's I mean I I almost want to add it to my open problem slide right now. Like, what is the fixed point? Of, uh, of of iterated neural subdivision with certain constraints on the, the training data, for example, right? So if you took a, a cube and you trained with a sphere, uh, what would you expect the network to, to converge to? Uh, you know, I, I don't know if it's possible to derive direct uh, guarantees, but uh, I'm going to make a long range connection. There's been some interesting work on, um, I, I think they're called fixed point networks. So basically the idea is you can take a a, a recurrent network with and and then learn another network which basically just expresses the fixed point of iterating it to infinity right so so you do away with the recurrence and replace it with this single fixed point behavior um, and I forget whether it comes with the uh, theory I, I looked at this paper briefly a long time ago but it, it might be possible to explore ideas like that in, in order to Again, this is a, I mean, it's, it's not quite recurrent. I prefer to think of it as a recursive network because the uh, number of triangles is going up in each stage, but, but it's still sort of sequential and chain structured. So uh, it, it might be useful to think about it in, in that context. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, that's a really, really interesting question. And, you know, next time I give this talk, I'll, I'll add that as an open problem and, and I turn <laughs> into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Siddharth, about the second part of your talk, uh, I was thinking a lot about um, how to maybe build on top of something like the Corgan. And so I, I work on um, multi-view stereo, right? I'm often doing reconstruction of all kinds of objects. And um, I was thinking that if I wanted to basically try to use the power of generative modeling to fix up problems in my reconstruction. How, how close are we to apply GANs to something like that? Would Because I was almost thinking in, in, your, in your framework, when you had the matrix completion problem, I was thinking of the stylized exemplars as maybe exemplars from a CAD database. And the course inputs could be like scans, noisy, incomplete, and is there a, is there a analogy there? Maybe I was just curious if you have thought about this. Um, is there is this sort of the a continuation of the work that could it's lead absolutely. us there? Yeah, it's, it's it's absolutely a continuation of the work. Uh, I I think that you know wherever you can apply an autoencoder, you can construct a denoising autoencoder, which is basically what you're. Uh, 
you're asking for. Uh, we haven't yeah. done an example with direct uh, scan shapes, though we probably should have in retrospect. Um, it, it's it's an, it's an obvious application. I, I think, again, the devil is a little bit in the details in terms of uh, what sort of noise you want to remove and uh, what sort of detail you want to add back and what the representation is. Is it as nice as a voxel grid or would you express it as a point cloud? Would you express it as LIDAR? Would you express it as mm-hmm. just a you know, uh, calibrated collection of uh, 2D images? Uh, and, and I think the, right. the frameworks would be a little different based on what your representation is. Um, so, yeah. No, there's a, there's a catch. I still want my reconstruction to be faithful to the images. So, so typically, um, we we would minimize something like when we reconstruct, uh, when we reproject the three D model onto the images, they should minimize some kind of photo consistency error. So, if you want to bring that, but you want to basically use the style example exemplar as some kind of a prior, right? To to clean up all the problems, like when reconstructing chairs, you want to make sure that you have four legs; they're fully connected. That that sort of thing. That's where I think it's a it's a little bit more complicated than directly applying decorgan. Because in, in decorgan, I could input a coarse voxelized representation of the scan, but it's hard to guarantee that it would resemble the input images. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I think there are you know, you know multiple ways in which you could go about that, and it depends on how you add conditioning to this uh, model, right? I mean, you could condition right. it on some CAD shape, but Actually, in retrospect, now in a what cat, where would you get this cat shape that you condition it on? Um, another thing could be to just condition it on the input image, and and you'd uh, you know you tweak the so so the, the training architecture would be different. You'd have to do the, these things in different ways, but you could ask that there is a certain amount of fidelity to the original image is maintained as a sort of reconstruction condition. So there could be a sort of stylization condition and reconstruction condition, and the two work in sync. Uh, another yeah. could be that you uh, you you fine tune the network and overfit it. To let's say differentially render back to your uh, to the image or whatever it is or collection of images that you started with. Um, so yeah. I, I think those are different ways in which you could think about taking it forward. But I agree with you that uh, the problem is not so much the network architecture as the choice of conditioning here. Yeah. But following up on that, do you feel like we have the right losses in place to capture these uh, details that we want to generate? Um, I think detail is a such a vague. Okay, so so we use detail simply yeah. because we think style is an even vaguer word. Even though I've <laughs> used style many times in this talk, right? But detail is also pretty vague. I mean, the sort of detail that subdivision, uh, I mean, neural subdivision uh, preserves is hardly the sort of detail that Decorgan synthesizes. Yeah. So um, I, I think. Uh, so, so maybe, maybe we can break it down in terms of what types of detail you're talking about. I, I certainly don't think that you know we are there. This is the first step. This is hardly the last step. Uh, but like, what sort of detail um, would you would you be interested in in hallucinating, for example? Mm. I mean, in this case now, for instance, we. When we're doing 3D reconstruction, for example, right, and what we can actually reconstruct from the the given, uh, let's say, multi-view stereo images versus then, um, and so in these cases, you, you, we're probably using some sort of uh, reprojection loss back to the uh, original images, right? Mm-hmm. But if the loss was sufficient to guide us in the first place, then we would have already captured those details, right? That's my assumption here. Whereas then we still rely on the scan to give us some extra detail or extra, oh, actually to, if I can call it this, I, I'm reusing the scan to hallucinate structure that I wasn't able to capture from the image itself, right? But that's not not just a factor of the loss, right? I mean, you, you could have a loss that is like an oracle. It's, it's so good that it's, when you, when you zero out the loss, you know you've got a perfect fit. But then your network okay. is uh, is is constrained in other ways because of its architecture, because of its size, or because of the training regime, because you're training it with SGD, uh, that you don't actually converge to zeroing out that loss. Mm-hmm. And and I think that's uh, and, and I'm not sure how the the artifacts that you see can be decomposed into these different things because you know we don't have an uh, an oracle loss that we can plug in and then ablate the rest of the pipeline. Sorry, the other way around. I mean, you you've laid out the loss and then you keep the rest of the pipeline fixed. 
and and see yeah. uh, what would happen so uh, i don't think it's just a question of the loss it is also undoubtedly you know the network architecture is not completely there yet um, and and uh, the training methods are not there yet uh, but uh, but yeah the, the loss is part of it i mean there are there are for example as you brought up topological consistency losses that are love to enforce except that they are brutally hard to enforce in a voxel regime so we need yeah. to move to some other representation to enforce that yeah okay um so we actually have a few questions in the chat box um let me type them into the chat here so you have some text reference as well so we can start with uh from Liu Yang Liu, uh, who's asking um, if you can discuss whether some you need some sort of uh, point-wise shape correspondence between the style and the content, or if this is learned implicitly, um, or if you need some some sort of pre-alignment in advance. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Interesting. Um, uh, hi Yang. Hi. Hi Mike. Uh, good to see you guys. Uh, you know well um it's um it's it's a interesting question we never actually dug into it to so so i, I think that the, the the point about your question is i don't know how to extract these correspondences out of the model because it's not really doing patch match you know that you can actually go back and look at the nearest neighbors and see if they are mapping out some sort of meaningful correspondences between the uh, the exemplar and the, the content shape so um maybe it is but off the top of my head i am not quite sure how to extract how to dig into the network to see if it is it is learning such a correspondence um, it it's sort of like patch match but it's not really patch match which is why i i can't give you this answer directly i think uh this your second question was any assumption about uh pre alignment of shapes in the training data said yes they're, they're all pre-aligned uh, we we didn't uh, as far as i remember we didn't train over different rotations but if you look at the plants for example i mean uh, they come in such weird flower pots and uh, leaf structures and branching structures and so on that uh, i mean they have an upright orientation yes but but other than that it's sort of impossible to actually align them to each other so there's a certain degree of robustness that that is there already but i don't think explicitly augmented it uh, I, I see Mike has a talk. Uh, sorry, has a question after that. Uh, what about conditioning the synthesis results in a two D image rather than three D shape? Uh, yes, um, very appropriate question. This is basically the conversation that I think uh, Shridipto and Angela and I were, were, were just having. Um, makes a lot of sense. Uh, we haven't done it, but it's an obvious thing to do. Uh, I, I think, uh, uh, for example, for the application that Shridipto mentioned, I, I think it's it's uh, it, it fits very well. So. I, I won't repeat that discussion, but but uh, I, I think it's a very very good question. Yeah. Um, any other questions or thoughts from our panelists, actually? Or... No. Uh, okay. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Thanks again for a great talk, uh, Sid. Thanks again, Angela, for organizing this, and you know. Thank you guys for participating also. Bring, bring thank all, you so much. all of thank us all. together. Yeah, thank it, all. It's wonderful to be on a panel that you know that that leads to such a great conversation. You know, thank you Angela and all the other organizers for this. It it was really really nice. So, uh thanks for having yeah. me. It was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, hosting is the the easy part. Uh, thank you to uh, to Sid for speaking with us and sharing his great work for us today, and also to our panelists Sudipta and uh, Galing who uh, for participating. And so, uh, yeah, I uh, welcome everybody who's watching out there to join us again uh, in a week. Um, I think we have still maybe two or three more uh, really great talks lined up uh, before we conclude for this season. Okay, then. Um, thanks very much again, then. And um, hope to see you guys around at the next conferences, either in person or online. Hopefully in person. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. All right. Take care, everyone. Okay, bye-bye.